Hi, my name is Carol Baskin, and I'm the founder and CEO of Big Cat Rescue. Today's guest is one of our longtime volunteers and a former staff member here. Her name is Katherine Quass, and she has just gone on a really big adventure to help out the folks over at Born Free in Ethiopia. Back in October, Adam Roberts from Born Free contacted us and said that they needed someone temporarily, at least, or maybe permanently, for their Ethiopia office. And Catherine was kind enough to offer to go for a few months. So she's over there now and checking in for the first time since she got there. And I'm really excited to talk with her today and ask a bunch of questions about what it's like to run a wild animal sanctuary in a remote place like Ethiopia. It's been like a 12 hour day today already. Oh. <laughs> I don't know if it's gonna be look my best or not. <laughs> well, I am no. so excited to talk to you. I just, I've never been to Africa or Ethiopia. That just sounds so exotic. And I'm sure that it's much more romantic sounding than it has turned out to be. But I would love to hear well, first off, um, what even made you consider doing this? Because that's like, that's like so out there. <laughs> <laughs> um, honestly, I the minute they asked me, I knew I wanted to go. I mean, I had been to Kenya twice on vacation, and so loved it both times and wanted to get back. And so the minute they asked me and told me where it was, my first thought wasn't, oh my God, it's in Ethiopia. It was, oh my God, it's totally in Ethiopia, I wanna go. <laughs> so, I mean, from the first time they told me where it was, I was so excited to go. Um, wow. Of course, it is, you know, it is a huge adjustment and it is very romantic to say, you know, I'm going to Africa to be with cats, but it has been a huge adjustment. So yes, you Starting know, with, there have been a lot of phone. things that I didn't <laughs> anticipate. <laughs> But um, it has been it has been a big adjustment. Well, take us from so. the time that you landed on the ground. What have you been doing? <laughs> well, so actually, I was worried about getting through immigration, but that would wound up being the easiest thing because I already had my visa and everything. But um, my luggage took like two hours to get to me because they had all these breakdowns and power outages and all kinds of fun stuff. But luckily, um, my ride was still waiting for me when I got out of baggage claim. And so um, really from the first minute I got uh, in the car, it seemed like I was you know, on another planet. I mean, it was the traffic was different. The people were different. Um, it was very different situation at that point. But, you know, it it also was was something really interesting and really cool. Um, the city of Addis was not what, what I, you know, pictured. Um, it's it has parts of it that are a real modern city with skyscrapers and interstates and all that kind of stuff. But you can go, you know, maybe a couple of blocks and you're in a place, you know, where they have houses that people have kind of cobbled together. They're dirt houses or they're metal siding, you know, houses and things like that. So it's kind of interesting that it is still both. It's a thriving skyscraper type city, and then it's also um, a city with, um, you know, people that are, you know, very poor and, and you know, living, you know, in a way that we would never see in the States, probably. Do you know how many people live in Addis? Um, I don't, actually. It is a huge city, though. Um, I don't know what the population is. I can certainly find out for you, but um, I don't know. But it is a huge city. And then the actual, it's kind of like we have in the States, the actual city limits of Addis is only part of the city. There's a huge area outside of Addis that I guess would be kind of what we would call the suburbs of Addis as well. So it is a huge area. And is that where you are currently broadcasting from? That's where I am right now. I am actually in Addis in the uh, Born Free Foundation office. Um, that's where I stay when I'm not at the actual rescue center. You sleep in the office? I sleep in the office, yeah. It's an office, and then they also have um, three bedrooms to accommodate people that are traveling in and out as well. Yeah, so it is actually, it's very nice. Um, and there have been other people that have traveled in. Born Free actually has several other um, things going on in Ethiopia and in surrounding areas. They're working on um, areas where the borders are. Um, because they're trying to stop trafficking of uh, cubs and things like that. Cheetah cubs and lion cubs, apparently the trafficking is, is horrible. 
And so they have um, a lot of other initiatives going on. The Ethiopian Wolf Project is also being run out of this office. So there's a lot of stuff that is going on through this office, and there are people that kind of stop in for the night um, here and there. So I'm not the only person that's staying here, but it is uh, it is a fully functioning kitchen, bathroom, bedroom, all of that kind of stuff, anything you'd expect in the States as well. And I was looking through Born Free's website about the different initiatives that they had, mm -hmm. and I wasn't clear as to whether they were run separately or if it was all being run out of the facility where you are. So that's interesting to know that there's mm -hmm. separate operations going on. Can you yes. tell everybody a little bit more about what your particular operation is, what it's called, where it is, how far it is mm -hmm. from where you are? Okay. So it's actually about 35 kilometers from here. It's uh, Look at to the you west. You're talking in kilometers. <laughs> I know. I totally had to learn all these different things. I don't know how many miles that is, but I know it's 35 kilometers. <laughs> yeah, it was really sad to not have my phone anymore because I had an app on my phone where I could figure out quickly the different um, conversions, and now I'm like, I'm just guessing. But I do know it's 35 kilometers. It takes us. It depends on the traffic because, of course it's a big city so there's a lot of traffic but it takes us anywhere from an hour to an hour and a half to get to the center in the morning and then about the same to get back in the afternoon mm. um, we've been traveling back and forth a lot lately um, but next week we're gonna actually stay out there for several days at a stretch so I will be um, out there for three or four days and then we'll come back to the office what um, so it is, is it 35 weather? kilometers outside of the city I'm sorry? What determines whether or not you stay out there? Is it weather or conditions of some sort? Some of it is weather, um, some of it's traffic, some of it's what's going on with the animals. Um, we have a couple of sick cats right now, so I need to be out there more than uh, just during the day. So it's you know kind of the same things at Big Cat. The reasons that we stay late at Big Cat are kind of the same reasons that I would stay late there. Yeah. but. Um, also, I do need to, you know, come back and forth because there is, there's no electricity out there. There's a little bit of solar power and there's generator power for tools and stuff for projects, but there's no typical, you know, go plug my laptop in um, electricity. So I do need to come back and forth to charge everything back up. Oh my goodness. I can't even yeah. imagine. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and there's no freezers and refrigerators. <laughs> so the meat gets brought in every day. Um, and it gets brought in um, just enough to get everybody fed and then a little bit extra for, you know, medications or things that may happen. Um, but the meat gets brought in every day because so, there's not a way to keep it um, there at the facility. How is that coordinated? So it's actually coordinated. There is um, a small town near the facility um, called Holeta. And they're actually working with the local butcher in town. And so he actually um, cuts it up to their specifications. So the lions have a certain weight amount and it goes in a bag. And then the cheetahs have a certain weight amount, it goes in a bag. So everybody's gets kind of divided up and the butcher actually does that for them. And then they bring it out to the center uh, every day around maybe 10 or 11 in the morning. Wow. Oh yeah, it's actually, you know, it's a pretty interesting system, you know, they don't have, you know, of course we couldn't do that at Big Cat because we have a lot more cats, but for the number of cats that they have here, um, it's actually a pretty great way to, you know, get the meat brought out every day and it's fresh, you know, it's not frozen. Oh, that's so, nice. yeah. So tell us about the animals that are at the center. So there are, um, there are lions, there are hyenas, there are cheetahs, there are primates, and there are birds of prey, and then there are also um, a lot of tortoises, <laughs> which tortoises. Um, the, tortoises, <laughs> the tortoises actually have been brought in from different places, um, more where they were making a nuisance out of themselves. They've dug up gardens or things like that, and so um, Born Free is trying to relocate them somewhere else, but of course, finding a place to relocate a nuisance animal, you know, it's not an easy task. Um, something that's thought of as a nuisance animal, that's not an easy task. So they are trying to, uh, to relocate the tortoises. How do the cats come there? So it started with lions, um, and so it did actually start with lions that had been kept um, at a palace. A prince was keeping them as pets. And so that's kind of how it had gotten started. And originally it was just gonna be lions. 
And then they started getting all, of course, they started getting calls for all the other animals as well. Um, so a lot of the cheetahs and the hyenas um, were uh, confiscated as cubs that were trying to be smuggled out of the country. And so a lot of those uh, animals came as cubs, and so they've grown up at the rescue center. There was uh, talk of trying to re, to re, um, we, sorry, rehab, uh, <laughs> reintroduce some of the cats, um, but the cheetahs are very rare in Ethiopia now in the, in the wild. There's not a lot of habitat for them, um, and they're being poached uh, heavily. So they don't want to, you know, re-release an animal into an area where, you know, it's just going to go right back into a dangerous situation. What is driving the poaching? Is it the cub trade or is it the fur? It's the cub trade. Wow. A lot of it is they kill the mother, take the cubs, and then they're trying to smuggle the cubs uh, into other countries. So my, it's not really the fur so much as it is the cubs. My last Cat Chat show guest was from the Cheetah Conservation Center. And she was talking oh. about how the cubs were being poached for that purpose and that it was primarily wealthy Saudis yeah. and um, mm -hmm. that area. It wasn't so much yeah. going to the U.S. Um, no. Yeah. So I guess you're seeing the same thing there, that mm -hmm. it's primarily over on that side of the globe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Ethiopia is just south of an area called Djibouti, and that is a port um, directly across from Saudi Arabia and so that's where they're going they're going right into that port and then you know right out of the country and so that's where a lot of the cubs are being uh, confiscated and then of course you know where what do you do with all these it's great that they stopped them from being taken out of the country but you know what do you do with the cubs once you catch them <laughs> so now you have all these cubs so there are um, several different groups of uh, cheetahs there's an adult male group of four cheetahs an adult female group of three cheetahs. There is one male by himself, and then there are three younger cheetahs. They're about nine months old, nine or ten months old, and that's three females as well. And most of them have come um, about the same time, and they were cubs at the same time. So they've kind of grown up together, so that's why they're grouped in those, those ranges. Is this your first time to work with cheetah? It is my first time to work with cheetahs. I have not worked with cheetahs before. Um, I like them. I, you know, I thought I thought that they would be close to the leopards, but they they are really not. They are more. Um, you know, I had heard that that people say that cheetahs were more dog like than cat like, and um, they are. They are not like the leopards. They're not sneaky and slinky and you know all that stuff that leopards are. They actually um, will. You know, they're curious and they'll walk right over to the edge of the enclosure to see you. Some of them will hang in the back, but some of them are curious, um, and they they um, you know they're different from the leopards as far as the, how they walk and how they run and what's um, interesting to them and things like that. They like to sit up high and look at everything, um, but they don't like to get in the tree like a leopard would. They like to get up on like a dirt mound and sit, you know, out in the open. Whereas the leopards like to get up in the trees and kind of hide. The cheetahs like to sit out in the open and just kind of look at everything. So it has been very different working with the cheetahs. I've heard they that. are also kind of fragile. Well, that's um, exactly like, what I was gonna ask. <laughs> yeah. They're kind of fragile. <laughs> They'll run around and chase each other, and then all of a sudden, one of them will be limping. Like it's it's almost like you don't want them to run around and play with each other. But um, those long legs are so fragile, and they've had um, problems with some of the cubs being too active, and they've had sprains, and even a cub um, break a leg oh, because dear. it you know tried to run up the side of the enclosure and stuff. So they are very fragile. Um, they catch. Uh, viruses and they'll get the flu and they'll get colds and really easily and so um, we've really had to watch them closely uh, for for any kind of eye runny or nose runny or anything like that because they catch stuff very quickly and then they don't throw it off very quickly so I, have, so I understand it's because important. they're so inbred even in the wild that genetically yeah. they're like identical to each other right right yeah, I mean, there, we have a group of four males, and even with, you know, all my practice at trying to tell cats apart, I, you know, I have to really look at them and count spots on foreheads to tell them apart because they all look exactly alike. <laughs> <laughs> so even size-wise, they're exactly the same height. I mean, everything, they are exactly alike. So it's been kind of a challenge to try and tell a couple of them apart. I never thought about that. 
Wow. Yeah, they they look all they all look so similar. They don't have a lot of different spotting that like the leopards do. So yeah. Tell me about the team that you're working with. So I am working with. There's actually several teams out there. So in addition to um, the animal care, you know, I'm used to the bulk of the work being. Uh, administrative or animal care, you know, at Big Cat Rescue. Here, it's not just animal care or administrative, it's the physical security. So the property is huge um, and it does have uh, fencing around it, but you know, the fencing has to be monitored. There's lots of local wildlife that comes in and out of the center, like uh, baboons, fervent monkeys, hyenas. Uh, yeah, so they've even spotted they've even spotted a leopard <laughs> occasionally that's come through, and so um, because area is really scarce, a lot of the animals have figured out that the born free you know area is um, you know is, doesn't have people a lot of people in it, and so they want to come through that area and they may be using it as a bypass to get to another area, but um, you know. Still, so that's a security risk, having all those animals coming and going. And then people, of course, you know, coming and going um, as well. And then animal security, because uh, at night, you know, there's a lot of things that can that can happen. They've been really concerned lately because they've seen a, the leopard near where the cheetahs are. And so, you know, there is a possibility that the leopard could injure one of the cheetahs. And so they have 24-hour security watching uh, the enclosures at all times. So it's a lot of a lot of manpower. Um, the and animal those care local people. Yes, yes, they are all local people. Mm -hmm. um, Barricut, the manager that runs the entire facility, um, he's actually local here to Addis. He grew up here, so he knows the area very well. Um, he and I have been actually spending a lot of time together because he's one of the few people that speaks English, and so I am with him a lot um, because you know I need a translator right now. For a lot of the stuff, I was uh, a couple of how that was care. working. Yeah, that has been that has been a very interesting challenge. You know, even just trying to figure out, um, you know, and at Big Cat we have our own you know vocabulary for everything. <laughs> so I would ask something, and he and he would look at me, and I could tell he has no idea what I just said. <laughs> so it's like I'm having to kind of coach myself in, you know, when I'm asking about a particular cat or what happened, you know, and he has to translate that for somebody else. What am I really asking? So um, that's been a little bit of a challenge. Um, the language barrier has been a little bit of a challenge. So I'm starting to pick up words here and there. Um, so, and I, you know, can read body language and stuff like that. So I'm getting a little bit better at it. And then there are a couple of animal care folks that speak some English. So we can have, you know, short conversations like, you know, did they eat last night? Did they come in? You know, that kind of stuff. But um, the, the vet that, uh, that they use that's here in town, she speaks English. And so that's been very helpful to me as well because she can kind of translate also. Um, and I got a good history of all the different cats and what to look for with each one, what their past medical issues were. Um, so we had, you know, good conversations about that, and I didn't need a translator for that, so that helped. Um, but yes, but the animal care uh, team is, they're an awesome group of people. They are there um, six days a week. Um, they uh, really care about the animals. They're all, you can tell that they're very, um, you know, they're animal people. They're, they're working really hard. They will try something. Um, we had a couple of uh, cats that were sick and anything I suggested that they try that might have been new for them, they were on it, you know, immediately, whatever they could do to help, whatever might work, you know, with a particular cat. So, um, you know, you can tell that they are animal people and they're really willing to try to do anything to help the, the cats in their care. So that's been great. Um, they know the cats very well. A lot of them have been there a long time, maybe since the cat first got there. And so a lot of them, you know, know a lot of history about that particular cat. I hadn't so really thought about it until you mentioned the language barrier. Any documents or records on the animals would probably not be in English. So coming in. That is you, correct. <laughs> wow. Yeah, all the documentation is not in English. And so... Yeah, that was very helpful that the vet actually spoke English and she could pretty much give me background on most of the cats. You know, that's how I knew that the cheetah, that they watched the cheetahs for things like leg problems and 
um, some of the lions have issues with eating things. And so she was able to kind of give me that backstory, which helped a lot because it's not like I could go back and look through the files because the files are all in um, Amharic is the language that they pretty much speak. And so they're all in that language. And so what right was now, the name of the language again? Amharic. Amharic. I've not even heard yeah. of that. Mm -hmm. It starts with an A. Yes. I had not heard of it either. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't think there's an app for that. <laughs> there's not an app for that. I looked. There is not an app for that. <laughs> I did look just in case, and there is not an app for that. <laughs> mm. So um, there is a lot of stuff, uh, actually, that has... Uh, English and uh, Amharic on it, like, um, you know, Coca-Cola looks the same. A lot of the stuff in the grocery stores look the same, and it will have the Amharic version and they'll have Coke, you know, like, you know, in English. And then a lot of the signs even around the city are in English. So it's not completely uh, in the other language. I mean, a lot of it I can, you know, kind of figure out. Um, they do drive on the right side of the road, so, you know, that's good. So I, I can drive here. <laughs> I was worried about, you know, having to try to figure out how to drive on a different side. Um, but I mostly just drive at the center. I don't um, really drive in town that much. It's kind of crazy. It's, you know, no real, like, lights or stop signs or anything. It's pretty much, you know, whoever gets there first. And so <laughs> it's, it's kind of a wild ride some mornings getting there. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned that your phone was stolen. What is it like as far as personal safety for you and for your things? So most of it is is great. They do have, um, Addis is like any other big city, they do have pickpocketing problems. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, I had my phone in my pocket and yeah. We went through a big crowd. It was actually when I went to get my visa. I had to get my visa renewed every 30 days. And so when I went to get my visa renewed, there was a large crowd in front of immigration. And as we were going through that crowd, um, yeah, my phone got taken. So, Wow. I know. I guess there's not a whole lot of use that you would have for it out there on the ranch, though. No, I mean, I mostly used it for, you know, the content that's on the phone, like, you know, um, books and stuff like that that I had on the phone, uh, documents that I had on my phone. You know, it's kind of like my mini laptop almost. Uh, so other than that, no, it wasn't. I wasn't making phone calls on it or anything like that. But when I'm, at, uh, when I'm here at the office, I could get Wi-Fi on it so I could get some texts and things like that. Um, but yeah, I, I was not able to make phone calls or anything with it. So Tell us what you hope to accomplish during the time that you're there. So um, one of the things that I actually didn't expect to uh, to be doing, but that I am helping out with, is um, they actually want to try to get uh, GFOS uh, certified. Oh, so they want to cool. try to they want to try to do that. And so um, I didn't realize that, but I've been helping um, Barricade a lot with what does that take and what does that really mean. And so um, I'm actually working on a lot of documentation to try to help them. Um, on that side of it because the documentation they have is um, is great and it's more about the animals not necessarily about like procedures how do you do this how do you do that um, how does everybody all the animal care staff do this the same way that kind of stuff that kind of documentation they they don't have a lot of and so I'm working on some of that documentation for them and then we're working on uh, some of the uh, animal care documentation to be both English and Amharic so that, um, you know, if somebody was coming in that did not speak the language, they could see what the documentation was. They could actually read the documentation if they don't speak the language or, or read the language. And for accreditation, that's going to be important because yes, they're going to need to be able to know what's happening right. there with the animals. Right. Well, right. Because, I mean, I can look at the document. I can look at the documentation and kind of tell what it is, but since I don't speak the language, I can't really see the finer points of, of the documentation. So we're working to try to put a lot of the documentation in both both languages so that uh, someone else coming in could actually read it. What does the facility look like? Like the cages, the work areas, the vehicles so, that we have, that sort of thing? Yeah, so I actually have some pictures I can send you. I oh, took some pictures right. of the office. 
Um, yeah, so the office is actually three shipping containers <laughs> put together. Yeah, um, it's a, <laughs> we thought about it, that. <laughs> it, it actually really worked, and I guess they had some containers left over from uh, the company that came through and actually built the road that goes in front of the facility. They had the the shipping containers, and that's how they got them. And it's a wonderful use of you know something that uh, that you know I wouldn't have thought of. But uh, so it's actually three shipping containers, and then the uh, actual vet clinic is also a shipping container. Um, and so they do have a little clinic with uh, some um, enclosures around it, you know, for our animals that have been sick. Uh, none of them are big enough for a cat. It's mostly the birds uh, and thing, and some of the primates, uh, some of the smaller primates um, that they would actually be able to put in the clinic uh, um, overnight or something like that. But the offices, there's an office for um, Barraquette, the manager. There's an office for uh, the animal care person. There's a kitchen and uh, a meeting room and a bathroom, like a regular, you know, bathroom. Oh, thank and goodness. So, <laughs> yeah, thank goodness they have that. <laughs> so, and then there are uh, two tents right now uh, on property for us to stay in when, they're, when we're up there. Um, but they're... Um, big tents like you'd see on you know like a, a mash or something they're big army tents you know they're not a little tiny pup tent you know that's going to set up and then they have uh roofs over the top of them um for uh rain and stuff like that so that it's not on the on the actual tent so it is it is a nice setup actually as far as you know camping goes <laughs> what the is the weather like huh what is the weather like so the weather is about during the day, it's about maybe 10 or 15 degrees cooler than it probably was in Florida when I left. So it's in like the 70s, the low 70s. Uh, in the mornings, it's in more like the 50s. It's colder at night. It's definitely colder at night. Um, but during the day, um, if the sun's out, it's in the 70s. It feels a little warmer than that, but you don't have the humidity of Florida. So it, it feels a little cooler than Florida for me, at least. And you started to say um, the enclosures? So the enclosures are actually, um, a lot of them they are using chain link, but they're not using it um, the way you would typically see it in the States. So they're using uh, posts and running the chain link on the inside of the posts. And then they're using um, kind of a steel cabling to reinforce the chain link. Because the chain link, you know, is it's not a gauge that's strong enough that's maybe going to hold back a lion. So they're running then uh, steel cabling through the chain link to add some structure to it. Um, I do have some pictures of the enclosures as well um, to that I can send you so you can you know see what those are like. Great. But they're large enclosures. They look, um, you know, more like our large tiger enclosures not as large as the vacation rotation but maybe as large as um like bengali's enclosure or um cam and zebu's enclosure they're large like that about and they're open half air. an acre i think or three quarters yeah. of an acre yeah they're open air um a lot of them have several sections so that they can move the cats around if they need to um they do have an extra enclosure right now because there's um, a couple of lions that are at um, a facility right now that they have been saying for a while that they're going to send to Born Free, but they haven't yet. So they do have an empty enclosure just in case they're hoping that that does actually happen. But it's one of those where, oh, we're gonna send them to you. Oh, we're not, oh, we're gonna send you, you know. So mm -hmm. they do have an empty enclosure for that right now. But, um, but the enclosures are open air. They do have night houses, I guess you could say, that are concrete type buildings for them to go in at night. Um, some of the some of the lions are good with that and some of them are not, so some of them get the option to stay, to stay out. Um, but most of them, that they feed them at night around five, and so they bring them in, um, you know, to eat, and then they stay in all night, and then they get let in, let out in the morning. But yeah, the enclosures are, they are big, big enclosures. When you had said earlier that people sometimes pass through the property, what does the perimeter fence look like that people and leopards 
are getting through that because if it's you know many hundreds or thousands of acres I imagine right. the fencing is not what you would have in the U.S. Right it is uh, it's wood posts with wire and barbed wire so there's wire at the bottom so the animals can actually pass through without getting caught on it so to speak and then the barbed wire is the top layer because um, they're trying to you know of course uh, keep people out with the barbed wire more than the animals. They actually, you know, they're not trying to keep the animals out necessarily that are passing through. Um, and the people that, that are around the edges, they're not actually coming on the property. They're just at the edges of the property. And are they passing through because it's easier for them to get from point A to point B through there? Or? Yes. Okay. So they're not yes. trying to come onto the property to cause any problem for the most part? Not necessarily. I mean, some of them may have figured out that it's a, um, it's a food source. I mean, it is, um, it's not developed. And so there is a big forested area. So it's protected almost for them, you know, to come through there. What do you so, find to be the biggest challenge? So um, the language barrier is a little bit of a challenge. I would say that's probably my biggest challenge right now. Um, the cats are not really, I mean, the cats are cats. You know, they're, they, they have the same personalities. It's been interesting to see that they do have the same personalities. Um, the lions have the same kind of personalities as the lions, you know. That <laughs> <they have. laughs> and we won't talk about that. <laughs> yeah, we won't talk about that. <laughs> but, um, yeah. So the, uh, I would say the biggest challenge is the, the language barrier is a little bit of a challenge. And then there is a little bit of um, some cultural things. Um, everybody has been very welcoming and they've made me feel very welcome. Um, but I'm, I'm the only woman at the facility. And so that's a little bit, you know, I can tell sometimes, you know, that that's a little bit of an issue, but they're not quite sure, you know, what, what to do with me. But um, that's probably been the biggest challenge I would say is the is the language barrier and then um, you know just adjusting to how different you know things are it is it is a it's very different it's a little more rustic you know than I'm used to at Big Cat you know we have everything at our fingertips constantly you know whatever we need and so it's a little bit different to have to figure it out um, with a different set of tools the people that you're working with I'm guessing that they're all paid staff yes is volunteerism something that happens there or would you have to rely on outside volunteers coming in for like an earth watch kind of thing they do uh they have a little bit of volunteering they have some uh school groups that come out and they'll volunteer they'll uh, come and build stuff or you know work on projects and things like that but i honestly the community that they live in i don't think um, I don't think those folks could really come and volunteer. I mean, the area that they're in is um, is an area that's that uh, I think it's even below what you know the United States would consider poverty. It's it's a small village, um, and so I don't think anybody you know really would have the time to come volunteer. You know, they're just trying to get what they need to get done every day. They're going to get water and carrying it, you know, several miles and things like that. So it's more of a situation where I just don't think they're close enough to the city to get volunteers. Um, you know, as well, it's just not, it's just not how they're set up. They're set up with, uh, with all paid staff. Good enough. It, and that is, I mean, you said it's an hour, hour and a half away. So that is a mm -hmm. long way to expect people. It's a to long come. way. Yeah. That would be like people coming here from the other side of Disney. Yeah. Man. Yeah. So, so and a lot of people don't have cars. I mean, you uh, know, it's a big city, so there are people that don't have cars. You know, uh, things like that. So it's not it's not as uh, as easy, you know, as it would be there in, in Tampa. You know, the way we have it. Um, and then you mentioned uh, volunteers. There aren't volunteers, but they do uh, tours. So people do come out to see the facility. Hmm. They have um, a uh, uh, education per person. His name is Million, and he does all the tours. And um, they do have fairly big groups actually that come out. A lot of school groups come out, and then they have you know just families and stuff like that. They don't have set tour times like we do. 
uh, at Big Cat, they have to call and make reservations, and then uh, someone walks that group around. So they don't um, they don't just come and wander around. The facility is not set up like that. It's set up for guided tours. How do they fund it? So it is really funded through Born Free. I mean, however Born Free is funded, I'm assuming they're funded the same way Big Cat is, donations and things like that. Um, they don't, they are not allowed to charge for anything. They can't charge for the tours and they can't like sell merchandise or anything like that because of the way they're set up here in Ethiopia. Um, this particular facility cannot do any of that. So people can donate. At, yeah, people can donate at the end of the tour, um, but they can't charge for the tour and they can't sell any merchandise. Because wow. that was the first thing I said. I'm like, is there a gift shop? <laughs> 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 Because this place I've been running in no time. <laughs> I was like, dude, we need a gift shop. <laughs> Get some sponsorship kits going. Yeah. Well, could they but do he's that? like, no, no, we can't sell anything. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> Is it but only it's the on way site? that it's set up here? Yeah, they just can't do it. Are they allowed to solicit over the internet? Or does that have um, to be done through free? Born Free UK solicits, I believe, because, um, you know, of course, the donations that Born Free gets, you know, fund this facility. So I believe that they can solicit donations. I think the folks here at the site can't solicit. Wow, yeah. that really makes it difficult. Yeah. Because that's so, the point at which people are most engaged with the animals is while they're right there. Right. Right. And a lot of, I mean, I have seen a lot of the tours come through and a lot of people do give donations. And so, um, you know, I, I, they are, you know, getting some donations that way, but I think most of the funding comes from, um, from Born Free Foundation. Mm. I know when you first went there, what they were looking for was a permanent person, but they said, hey, we'll take somebody even temporarily. So is your job going to be grooming the next person or are you just filling a space until they find that next person? Or are you that next I'm, person? <laughs> of course, I'm worried about I'm that. I'm filling a space until they find that person. Um, and then I am actually working with um, a couple of the folks in at Born Free UK to write um, a little bit different description to kind of help them find someone. Um, because I think they weren't really sure uh, what that person was going to do and how to describe it. You know, because even when they told me what it was and I've actually gotten here, it's really not what I thought it was going to be. Um, it's close. I mean, it's, you know, taking care of the cats, but there's also a lot of other things, um, you know, as well. And then I'm also writing up a, a document for the next person so they know what to expect before they get here a little <laughs> bit. But um, they've had a lot of issues with uh, getting visas for people to come in and take this position. And so I think they're, they're working on, uh, on that so that that won't happen to the next person. The next person will be able to get their, uh, their visas in line a little easier. Because that's what happened to the person that was in the position before me is their visa didn't get pre-approved. Mm. And so they had, they had to leave. So they're working on, uh, on getting better, um, more permanent, like work permit, instead of the temporary visas you know, that, that we're coming in on. Um, they're working to get more of a work permit for that person that's coming in. And from what I understand with the visa issues that we have trying to bring people in from the UK, the situation is that the immigration wants jobs to go to local people. They don't want mm -hmm. outsiders coming in and taking what they perceive as local jobs. So it really has right. to be somebody who is uniquely qualified for that job. And so yes. you had explained um, how, and, and this is certainly true, it's not a matter of what your um, schooling is for this yes. kind of a job. It's really, do you yes. have any idea how to take care of big cats or the other types of animals that are there? Yes, yes. Which is well, and even, you know, um, you know, and no offense against someone that has a biology degree or a zoology degree, you know, being a biologist, a wildlife biologist, and studying animals in the wild is completely different than a captive, you know, population of cats. Um, so it, it's hard to make that distinction, you know, not everybody knows that that's very different. They think, oh, wildlife biologists are totally not to take care of lions. It's like, well, sure, if they were studying lions in the wild, that would be true, but, you know, 
getting a lion to take its meds when it doesn't want to take its meds is very different than studying an animal in the wild. And so, you know, it's a very different situation to manage a captive population of cats. And so they're having trouble, you know, kind of making that that judgment call. The the um, the folks that are looking at the criteria, they're like, oh, well, you don't, you know, you're not requiring somebody to have a, a million, you know, PhDs to take care of these cats. So why is it so hard to find someone? It's, you know, it's a... It's a select skill set that's maybe not a degree, you know, to take care of them. Is that something you think you could actually teach to somebody there? Uh, the the kind of insights that you have in caring for all the animals that you've cared for so long here at Big Cat Rescue, is that transferable in the kind of time that you have to do that? Um, I think some of it, some of it might be. Um, the, you know, Barakat, the manager, and I have talked through this, and he, he is very, you know, familiar with the fact that it's a different skill set. Um, and he's been trying to fight that fight as well. So um, it's not that, you know, that nobody understands that. It's getting the, uh, the folks at immigration to really understand it. And, and that's a tougher battle, I think. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Because they just have nothing on which to base their <laughs> understanding of that situation. Right. Hmm. So, currently, when do you plan to be home? So, currently, my visa uh, expires on February 10th. And so, I will be home shortly after that. Um, we're going to try and get an extension to it, but they, uh, when I got the first extension, um, they were saying that, that uh, the immigration laws had kind of changed and that they were only doing 60 days instead of 90 days. Mm. And so, um, you know, I would only get the one 30-day extension, but we're going to uh, to try and and get an extension on it. But right now, um, if I don't get the extension, my visa it expires on the tenth. And is this something where you can keep going back? Like our interns are able to keep coming here, but they have like some limitations. They have to go home for a certain amount of time, and then they can go back. Is this something that you would be continuing to go back if you can? Um, yes. I mean, if, if they wanted me to come back, I would certainly come back. Um, I don't know that I could get a, be a business visa again, um, but, you know, I could certainly come back on a tourist visa or something like that. They do have a tourist visa um, that you can actually get the same amount of time that I got the night that I thought I was going to get the 90 days. Um, it would just have to be, you know, really careful as far as, you know, am I getting paid or am I not getting paid? Um. Things like that. So, yeah, I yes. didn't think about that part. Since I'm actually getting paid, I can't come back on a tourist visa. So I don't know if I could come back on a bit, another business visa, if they would grant me another business visa, um, you know, or if, you know, we'd have to work out something else. But I would certainly come back again um, if I could. Well, that's good. Yeah. You know, I didn't think of this until just now, but as you're trying to put documentation into place, if there's no electricity or computers or anything at the facility, then does that mean everything that's documented has to be housed back in Addis and people have to constantly be coming back to the office there to access those records? Um, kind of, yes. If they were online records, a lot of their records, um, they are handwritten. Mm. A lot of their animal sheets, they have a sheet that they fill out for each section of cats. Um, well, and the hyenas, I keep forgetting the hyenas. There are actually hyenas here too, so I keep saying cats, but there are actually hyenas as well, um, and the primates. So they have sheets for each individual um, animal section, and then they fill out, you know, for that day if somebody didn't eat or if somebody looked weird or things like that, but they're doing it hand. They're, they're handwriting it at the end of the day. Um, and then I believe those get scanned in, but um, they're handwriting a lot of it right now. So um, Barakat and I are actually trying to work on something. He has a laptop that he uses while he's out there. Um, some of the solar power uh, goes to power his laptop. So we could put some of it uh, on a laptop. Um, they don't have internet access though, so it would have to be you know, in a spreadsheet or something like that um, on his laptop. Hmm. Wow, just so you many know, different things that you wouldn't. Very different. <laughs> 
all that stuff that we take for granted that's at our fingertips all the time. It's been a little bit of an adjustment. <laughs> I guess so. so. Yeah, mm. even, I mean, and, and you know, um, you know, at Big Cat, we use like 30 different kinds of meat, you know, with the cats. And, you know, I don't have that availability here. So, you know, it's, it's been interesting too to have to do that. You know, we have to drive into town to get a specialty meat you know, that the butcher hasn't already delivered and, and, and they, he may not even have it, you know. So even just trying to get um, chicken versus beef, you know, we might have to go to a couple different places just to get chicken. <laughs> if I want to try chicken with somebody <laughs> that won't eat. So it's been, it's been kind of interesting, you know, to go from every kind of meat you could possibly think of, you know, to, okay, well, the butcher has this, <laughs> and this is what I have to use. <laughs> So, yeah, that's been a little bit of an adjustment, too. I don't think our cats could adjust. <laughs> I don't think they could. I really don't. I don't think they could. I mean, and then, you know, again, we have cats that are like, uh, I don't want to eat that today, you know. And these guys are, you know, the butcher brings it, and we have no refrigerator. We have no freezer. They don't eat it. <laughs> you know, we hope they're hungry the next night. <laughs> Because there is, you know, there's not a lot of, there is no going to the freezer or the refrigerator and getting something else if somebody's being picky. So, uh, yeah, it's been a little bit of an adjustment, you know, because we'll go through like 10 different kinds of meat, you know, with somebody that won't take their meds. So, it's been very interesting. Oh, my. Oh. Yeah. So, to, if people want to help, obviously, they should donate to Born Free. Born Free... Does it matter which born free is after the one? No, uh, I think it's all the same. There is a there is a born free uh, in the United States, but then there's also a born free UK, um, and so I think it all goes to the same place. Okay, and I'll put links to that in the cat chat show. Yep. Is there anything else people can do, or anything else you would like people to know about what's going on there? Man. Um, there, I don't think there's any other ways to help other than donate. Right now, that's the that's the best way to help them out. Uh, promote them. They do. Uh, they have a Facebook page, so promoting the Facebook page would probably be helpful. Um, they, you know, they want to get out there and they want people to know about them. Um, so that's probably the biggest way is to help. Super. Anything else you want to okay. say about your experience there? We're up at the. At, we're at an hour now. <laughs> it went by fast. Uh, it, it, it has been it has been a great experience. Um, you know, any if anybody ever has the opportunity to come, I would not be afraid to do it. Don't don't be afraid to go and try it. Everybody has been so welcoming and has tried really hard, you know, to help me fit in. And so I would not be afraid to do it. It sounds huge and daunting, but it, it really wasn't. It was it was really easy to come to come and do this. So. Um, other than the fact that, you know, I'm gone for so long and I miss my family and everything. Um, but it it has been a great experience, and I would recommend it to anybody that has the opportunity to do it. Well, as part of your extended family here, and speaking on behalf of all of the cats, <laughs> we miss you too, and we look forward to your return. Aww. But we're just so <laughs> proud of you for going there, and I think Thank it you. was such a, a brave thing to do. And. <laughs> It really impressed me that you were like, sure, I'll do that. <laughs> sure, I'll <do. laughs> Well, I appreciate that. Thanks. Um, it doesn't, it really doesn't feel that brave because it's been, it's been, um, you know, a great experience. So. Well, that's wonderful. Well, thank you for joining us today. And this was Catherine Quas. She is a green level keeper here at Big Cat Rescue and working in Ethiopia with the Born Free Foundation at their, does the facility have a name? It is, it's uh, it's a very long name, um, and I can send it to you, but it's NSSCOTEC. Okay, we're gonna spell that across the bottom of the yeah, screen here. We'll spell, <laughs> we'll spell that one out. I can uh, definitely send you an email with that spelled out, and I'm sure I'm butchering that, per that pronunciation, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks again. It's been such You're a welcome. pleasure. Bye-bye. Thank you. I appreciate it. Bye.